dancing quote monkey is here. Dance a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> dancing quote monkey. Talk about uh, TJ's attitude, man. It sounds like, you know, you mentioned the difficulty of what he had to put himself through. I mean, it, it seems like he's kind of a breath of fresh air and, and the kind of fighter you want to work with. Yeah, no, it's, you know, I say it all the time, and it's, it's so true, and it's never more true than in moments like this with partners. You know, we do our part, they do their part, and the whole thing works out for everybody, and, and this was the perfect example of it. You mentioned you didn't sleep last night, though. What was, what was going <laughs> I don't, on I don't sleep as it is without this shit. This, this has been a crazy month. Um, but, you know, I was, I was up bright and early on the phone walking the streets of, of uh, Sacramento this morning, and... Uh, I was, I was talking to Lorenzo. I said, I, I'm, I think I'm addicted to chaos. I love it. And what did you think? I mean, obviously the show, it, it started out a little slow, I think, maybe. but uh, by It started out a little slow because we had three fights for the prelims in two hours, you know? We had to do what we had to do. But uh, th these guys came in and, as usual, delivered. It was a great show. With some great fights. I mean, some of these fights tonight were. That fucking choke, I've never even seen anything like that. The combination and how many punches she landed in a short amount of time. Like I said, I haven't seen that since Baroni Manet. And uh, what was the other great? Uh, uh, you know, I, I think Tony is one of the most exciting up and coming fighters there is right now. That kid put himself in harm's way in ugly positions to try to win the fight, to try to finish the fight. And, and, and uh, you know, he's exciting and fun to watch. Um, and TJ, like I said, handled this whole thing like an absolute stud. And Soto was a guy who didn't just come to, you know, to, to, to fill a spot. He came to win. So it was a great night. What did, Daniel, you, last what time did you think of Morales, you know, when he had the conversation with Joe Rogan, kind of told what happened? I didn't hear it. You didn't hear no, it? No, I didn't hear it. So last minute I pulled the trigger on that thing. I said, get Morales, uh, get Morales here. I, I want him to go on TV. And I want to hear because the doctor said he was fine and he was good. So we got him in here like last minute, and Joe was all fired up to sit down and interview him. So I didn't hear it yet. How would you rank this uh, with Burrell pulling out the at the you know day before the fight? How would you rank this as like a cluster? One of my shittiest moments yeah. ever. Yeah, one of those. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Top three. Yeah, you know it's different when it's different when you get that call and a guy gets injured and stuff like. But when a guy doesn't make weight, yeah, it's just it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Dana, uh, in TJ Dillashaw, you clearly have a champion now that is willing to go for a finish even when he's pitching a shutout on the scorecards. And historically, you've been frustrated even with guys like uh, uh, Anderson Silva. Some fans get frustrated with GSP when, when that would happen. I mean, he's very self-effacing in his comments about that, but to you, that's got to mean a lot that he's he does. He's exciting. That. He's exciting. You know, the kid... Uh, you know, when you ask him how the fight was going and what did he do, explain it to you, you know. This, this kid I had to watch out because, uh, you know, uh, he's a good wrestler and if I get too close, we get down on the ground. And that kid's really good on the top, too. He's just he's great on the top. And, uh, you know, but he stayed outside, he picked him apart. The punch down on that thing was ridiculous. He hit him with, with a ton of punches and uh, he dominated him. He did it. He, he fought a great fight and he stepped up. And I mean, I, can, I, I couldn't say enough good things about him today. Yeah. You know, he's, he's awesome. It, it also seems, too, I mean, it's one thing to take the title, but it seems like in the process of getting it and then defending it tonight, he's really making himself marketable. Right. I agree. I agree. Dana. Hold on, this guy. Sure. Uh, so, basically, given all the time and effort and money that you put into promoting the headliners and the fact that they receive potentially uh, pay-per-view points, could you ever consider some sort of scenario where barring an act of God or an injury, there is some accountability for these guys that when they don't come in, there is some, you know... There's serious accountability right now for Burrell. Burrell, listen, you know, there's no excuse for what he did. You don't come here and not make weight, but he pays all the penalty. Yeah, it hurt us, you know, it hurts the show and everything else, but... That kid didn't make a paycheck. He's going home with no money, going home without a dime. He hasn't fought. He just paid for a camp, and who knows when he's going to fight again. So believe me, the, the, the penalties in this sport are worse than any other sport. You know what I mean? You hear, you hear and, and Barrao's a guy who just got to the point where he's making big money now. You know, the kid's finally in a position where he's making great money, and he just missed an entire payday after going through a full camp. That's, it's pretty tough to penalize him any more than that. Um, and who knows when he's going to fight again, so. Did you talk to him about that, like, about how he was feeling or, like, how he's going to fight? No. No, I don't really ask guys about their feelings too much, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I said to him, are you okay? I mean, you know, for, first of all, you want to know that he's healthy and that he's okay. 
that's that's more important than any fight or any sporting event. Um, as upset as we all are with him that he didn't make weight, you know, you don't want to keep treat the kid like he's not a human being. You know, he's he, he's a good kid. He's not a bad guy. For some reason, whatever the reason is, he and his camp know that reason. Either they've been doing it for so long, and they've been lucky, and they've made that weight, and now he's 27 and he just can't do it anymore, right? It's been so hard, and this time they didn't make it, and maybe that's why he performed so badly in his last fight, you know? Who knows what that answer is? They know the answer, and they need to do the right thing and fix it. Is the right thing, get rid of the nutritionist you have and get a better one, or is the reality, you can't make that weight anymore, move to 45, figure out with your buddy Aldo what he wants to do. If you guys decide to fight each other, I'm fine with that, I got no problem with that. Or if you don't, then he goes to 55. Dad told me today that they are going to do some tests with him in Brazil to see how his weight is going and they are going to go from there. Yep. This is 100%, like I said, to this gentleman here, you can't, you couldn't penalize a guy any more than this kid has been penalized. Okay? He's been through hell. And, and hell isn't over for him because he's going home without a paycheck. So he's been penalized. Now he and his team need to seriously sit down and look at this and make the right decision for Hen and Barral. Dana, you've got like a billion things to think about. Do you, do you have any idea if he came in heavier this week than he normally does? I don't know because when when they come in, we we weigh all of them. Right. So we have a good idea where everybody is and we know where they are. What happened is this time, I think, and you, don't quote me on this, um, most places will anyway because I said it. Um, uh, he, uh, I think he got to that 38 point. You know, he got to 38 and that was it. His body shut down and it wasn't cutting any more weight. He said he needed to lose like two pounds when like the, it felt like, you know. Three pounds. And then, like, he was at 38 when, when, he, when, he, when he fainted. And it wasn't even a faint. What happens is once you deplete all of the electrolytes in your body, you basically become paralyzed. That's what happens. You become paralyzed. You can't move any of your limbs. And, you know, they had to come and call 911 and have a... And you go in, they, they put it back into your body, take some time, and then you're, you're back to normal. But that's what he did. And when that happens, it means one thing. You cut your weight the wrong way. You cut your weight the wrong way. Somebody wasn't there monitoring you cutting your weight and know where your body is. And, you know, he needs a better nutritionist, in my opinion. But I don't know, I don't know all the answers. So maybe I'm wrong. So they know what they need to do, and they need to fix you, it. Is there any direct conversation in the wake of something like that happening between the promotion and the camp, not just Burrell, but the camp, in terms of the nutritionist and, you know, there's not a Mike Dolce of Brazil? Well, I mean, do you well, have that conversation? Listen, this goes, back to, this goes back to, like, hey, Dana, talk to these guys and tell them to stop taking drugs. Dana, don't let these guys spend all their money. Dana, tell these guys to pay their taxes. <laughs> They're grown men. You know what I mean? They're grown men. And I'll give you an example. Kelvin Gastelum. Okay? Remember when Kelvin didn't make weight? Okay. Well, he didn't want to. He didn't want to spend the money on Dolce. So what he did was, he he talked to Dolce for a while, and they tried to copy what Dolce does. And you saw the result of that. You're at a level now where you're making this this much money. Get a nutritionist. He's as important or more important than your actual trainers. You know? Or don't cut as much weight. Either do it the right way with the right people, or don't do it. This is this is this is your job. You uh, you obviously made this statement with Cejudo. He's got a choice: either go to 135 or don't. Well, fly this here. guy has this guy has like serious history of doing right. this, and he's never even you know fought here yet. Right. And from judo, he's had lots of weight cutting issues there, you know, on his body, like. Takes a toll on your body after a while. So you guys, you guys came close with Tiago Alves. I remember when he missed weight a few times, where you're almost to the point where you pulled the trigger and said, "You know, go to 185, or that's it." Yeah, like Anthony Johnson. Yeah. So with Burrell, what what is the? Because obviously this is a big moment to miss weight. Right, right, but it's the, it's the only time he's never made weight. Is he on a shorter leash though? He misses it again or anything like that. Like, yeah, it's a big deal. Is there any reason the sunset wouldn't be next? I mean, it, it seems like he's logical. Makes sense. Yeah. Daniel, last time you were here in California, you were asked about uh, Corona. You said it was complicated. Yeah. The updates? It's still complicated, but we're <laughs> we're uh, we're so close. But there's there's like a couple of minor issues, and it'll be done. Uh, she's signed by the end of the year. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
But I'd have told you six months ago she'd be <laughs> signing six days too. So we'll see what happens. You still feel confident that that's the next fight for for Ronda though? I don't know. I did at one point. I don't know now. Could that, that obviously could change with Kat Zingano at the end of September? Mm -hmm. She wins big. I mean, does that definitely, definitely? She's next in line. I mean, this girl looked great tonight. You know. When will home fight? Ah, uh, I don't know. That I don't know. Last time we had a fight here in Sacramento, you were asked about a uh, possible uniform policy. You said you were working on it. Mm -hmm. Any updates since then? You know, the, the, un the uniform thing is, is something that we're looking at long term um, for all the fighters. I mean, it, believe me, if we get that thing done, I know, I know there's been a negative, you know, everything we do, there's negative <laughs> shit written about it, but it will be great for the fighters if we get it done. Any front runners uh, that will lead that? <laughs> you uh, you told us yesterday about the whole situation with Tyron Woodley and Hector Lombard. Usually, when you say something, blows out on the internet, and then sometimes you hear back. Did you hear anything else from? Well, that Tyron wasn't my intention. I wasn't trying to get. I know Tyron Woodley doesn't want that fight. Or from Lombard, for that matter. Like anything else from them? Did they contact you after no. that? No. I mean, that was it. I, you know, Tyrone doesn't want the fight. Hector Lombard wants the fight bad. Um, you know, that was it. You know, I, I saw people saying, "Oh, Dana does this every time to get the fight." I'm not trying to get. I know. I, I, in no way, shape, or form did I think I was going to say that to you guys yesterday and Tyrone was going to call me and say, I want that fight now. He doesn't want that fight. Did that you're, reaction you're from Tyrone surprise you, given the fact that six, seven months ago, he was a guy that you would specifically identify as he texts me a right. hundred times a day? This is the shit that always happens every time a guy gets up into the top four or five. This is the way that, you know, and it's, it's guys who, who handle it the way that Tyrone does that, you know. Well, Tyrone did step up and take that fight in China. So, you know, uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll but see. You're, you're saying it doesn't surprise you that maybe you see an increase in reluctance from him or calculation now that he's. It doesn't up matter. I mean, you can be as reluctant as you want. You're going to end up fighting the fights that you have to fight. You know, and, and anybody in that top five or six, you're not avoiding anybody. You're, you're going to end up fighting them, or you just sit out. You know, everybody thinks because of this. You know, we go through these injury bugs. They're like, yeah, I'll just wait, and you're, somebody's going to get injured in one of the big fights, and you'll need me anyway. But that's a, uh, it's the wrong way to look at it. I've seen so many guys play that card and it doesn't turn out well for him. I was going to say, I mean, when you say that he doesn't want that fight, are you saying because he's trying to manage, like, what rank he's fighting, or do you think he just doesn't want a piece of, of Hector? No, I think that he wants to uh, He wants to fight, you know, I think he's fifth, and I think uh, Hector Lombard is sixth. He's saying, I don't want to go that way. I want so to go it's a situation way. that he's below him, not like, hey, they've trained together, right. he knows he doesn't want the fight. Right. I, you know, who knows? O only, only Tyrone knows that. If he really wants to fight him or doesn't want to fight him, um, well, but, but I think I think maybe if he was ranked number three, maybe Tyrone would take the fight instead. You know, um, but I don't know that. And you never know that when you call a guy and he doesn't want to fight somebody, you don't know what, what the real reason is. Is it that he you know he doesn't think he can beat him, or is it because because that's what he told me. He goes, I don't want to go in that direction. I want to go in this direction. He said, I just took that last fight in the other direction. You know, meaning a guy who's lower ranked than him. I want guys that are higher ranked than me. But you can't sit around and wait for those type of fights or you're not going to make any money and you're going to be inactive for a while. So it doesn't make sense. And that's what I say. Sometimes it always doesn't work out for you when you pull that stuff, you know. Didn't he it ask for Matt Brown? Many, many, him. many times. Didn't he ask for Matt Brown, who's actually behind him in the rankings, though? He asked for that fight. <laughs> Who did? A Tyron. This oh, week. he did? He asked for Matt Brown. I think Matt Brown's six. He didn't ask me for that fight. <laughs> I talked to him three times. He didn't ask me for that fight. <laughs> Do you like that fight? I like Matt Brown versus anybody, <laughs> but Matt Brown's hand is messed up. You know, Matt Brown, did I tell you that yesterday? I called him, yeah. and he's like, he told me, I'll take that fight right now. I'm in. I'm 99.9, .9. and then his manager started calling Joe Silva freaking out. He's hurt. He can't take that fight. <laughs> so that's why I love Matt Brown. Dana, you've been trying to get Eddie Alvarez for years, and all of a sudden Scott Cooper takes over Bellator, and you got him two weeks later. How did that go down? Um... I don't, I don't think we were trying to get him for years. It's where Eddie wanted to be for years, you know. At the end of the day, it's, the, guy, the guy got so screwed over over there. And it's, uh, it's good that Coker did the right thing. You know, that, kid, that kid had taken enough beat of a beating. Do you think there will be a better relationship now, that Coker's in charge, that, that you know, you'll have a better relationship with that organization? Or? And I won't say anything bad about them. They don't say anything bad about us. I don't say anything bad about them. The... the, the you know, my bullying rivals, or however that was said, you know, 
it was always whoever, sh you know, they fired shots first and had things to say how the UFC doesn't do this and the UFC doesn't do that and we're going to do it better. Now you just picked a fight with me. Now we're going to fight until somebody wins and somebody loses. I mean, that's kind of the way that it went down. Um, and that's called being competitive. Apparently, that dork from wherever the hell he's from, uh, Deadspin, you know, isn't a competitive guy. That's how competitive people work. Dan, do you think the last second main event switch up <clears throat> might have spiked interest in the pay-per-view? People purchasing the pay-per-view? The last spike? In no, the, la the, spot, like, uh, the last second switch up in the main event. Do you think that might have piqued people's interest? You know, you never know what's going to sell pay-per-view, you know? Sports Center was all over this thing when it happened. Um, you know, a lot of people were talking about it. It was trending on Twitter all day, the day of the weigh-ins. Who knows? That might be the silver lining in this whole thing. You know, ticket sales were great. You know, you were impressed with that. You were impressed with ticket sales overall. Yeah, the better than what Dave Meltzer said they were going to be. <laughs> Dana, I, I noticed blatantly that you guys were putting up the Invict advertisements at the bottom of the screen. Is this something we're going to see more and more as we go along? Yeah, they're fighting on our fight pass. Yeah, yeah. It'd be pretty shitty if we didn't promote it. Wouldn't <laughs> it? <laughs> Dana, if you were if you were Danny Castillo, what would you do at this point? He's thirty five. Uh, I mean, here is a guy that has stepped in on short notice for you many, many times. Mm -hmm. and he's always been kind of a UFC guy. Yeah. What's a, what would you do if you were him? Still you know, it's it's always up to the athlete what they're going to do. Is he going to continue to fight? Is he going to retire? You know, that's up to him. You know, Castillo. Um, Castillo's last fight was awesome. You know, this fight here, he fought. I just said that I think Tony Ferguson is one of the most exciting, you know, talented young guys out there. He's on a huge win streak, and uh, you know, it was a split decision. So I don't know if I'd be calling for Danny Castillo's retirement or resignation. It's up to him as an athlete. I, I had uh, Ferguson win that fight. How did you guys have that fight? I was actually waiting. I had Castillo. I had Castillo. Ferguson Castillo? I had Castillo based solely on that, that last-minute triangle choke attempt. It was Every right. judge gave him round three. It was actually round two where he lost right. the fight. Two. Yeah. Round, yeah. Two. round two. Yeah. Yeah. Round two was the swing round. Yeah. Here's my thing. You, you can't win a fight by trying to blanket a guy. Now, Tony Ferguson was going for things. He was throwing elbows and punches from the bottom. He was by far the most active fighter. You know, he was actually going for stuff and trying to win and finish the fight. You, you can't score a guy to just clamp on and hold. I mean, that's what he did. He'd never even prop up, you know, and try to ground and pound or anything. He didn't do anything. He just tried to blanket him. And, and especially, you know, we're always bitching about the judging and everything. You can't lay in there, fight like that, and expect to win a judge's decision. It's craziness, you know. I was actually happy because I felt the judges awarded the guy who was actually trying to finish the fight and do damage, you know. So that's the way I saw it. Gustafson said today that he spoke to Lorenzo. And Who did? Alexander Gustafson. Okay. That he spoke to Lorenzo. That Lorenzo said, you know, he could get the winner in Sweden, but if, if the UFC wants him to take a fight, he'll do it. So do you think now that he will fight maybe around the same time as Joe CC? It makes sense for him to fight. It makes sense for him to fight. He should fight. He should stay active. He should keep making money. If you know, and, and the thing is, when you get to that level, when you're at the level of a Gustafsson or a or, or Tyrone Woodley or any of these guys, why would you not want to stay busy? Stay busy, keep making money, and, and wait for your shot. Is Rumble the fight that you would make? I like that fight. Would you make it around the same time as? I don't know when we're gonna make it. I like it. I don't know. I didn't even know those two talked. Right. I didn't know. Uh, have you talked to Gray Maynard? No. Have you? Uh, I talked to his manager. And what's he thinking? He still wants to fight. Does he? Yeah. I'm interviewing you now. Um, what do you think of Manny Pacquiao getting in MMA? I like Manny Pacquiao. Did you hear that he's uh, invested in yeah. one FC? Yeah. Many surprising? people have invested in MMA. Does that surprise you? Um, no. You know, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, fun, it's exciting. It's a good way to lose a lot of money. <laughs> Hey, Dana, Faber said that, you know, jokingly, obviously, it would take a billion dollars from the UFC to get him to fight the other shot. I mean, it would take a billion, a billion dollars to get dollars who to fight who? For Faber, for him to fight his good teammate, the yeah. shot. Now, obviously, <laughs> the number is going to be a far less in your mind. Would you put a number on that? Is there something that... I, I think that when, you know, you have a team, it's no different than George St. Pierre and, and Roy McDonald. You know, when you have a guy, guys who are part of a team they train together I mean tonight when they win that you know they're all excited for each other His, their families are here you, you don't run around saying I'll fight him tomorrow I want his belt and all this stuff you know and everybody believes they can beat each other in the back of their mind because they all train together um, 
But when it comes down to it, Faber would 100% fight him for way less than a billion dollars. <laughs> and TJ would definitely fight him. And it's like Roy McDonald is in GSP's house, you know what I mean, meaning his gym and everything. He's not going to run around saying, yeah, I want, I want GSP for the belt. There's just a way, there's a time and a place and a way to do that. You're never going to hear the guy say it publicly. They would never do that. But contractually, I mean, how much can you lean on Faber or Dillashaw to make well, that Well, Fa Faber's, Faber's got to be in a position to fight for the yeah. title. You know what I mean? He's got to go in there and beat somebody and be in a position to fight for the title. And if he is, I promise you he will do it. I know he will. And I know TJ will fight him too. Dana, over the weekend, uh, obviously you had way too much going on to know this or this, but, but Ben Askren won again over the weekend, really mauled his opponent again. He actually sent you a tweet, I don't know if you saw it, he joked, he said, if you're just giving out title shots, I'll take one. Uh, will you ever revisit Ben Askren at some point? Now, I mean, is he like under contract? I think he has a clause in his contract that he could get out of it if he, like, if some, there's some clause in there, I think, where he could get out of his contract. Yeah. Will you ever revisit the Ben Askren situation? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think if, if he keeps winning and, you know, get a shot over here. We're on the uh, verge of the debut of the next season, The Ultimate Fighter, and there's never been more on the line than this season. You're going to crown a champion for the first time, and also it's the inauguration of an, an entire division. I know you can't give away a lot, but can you give us an idea based on that unprecedented, the unprecedented aspects of what's at stake, how happy you are with, with the I progress? Love this. I love this season of The Ultimate Fighter. It's way better than last season of The Ultimate <laughs> Fighter. Um, and I think I, I, I know people. Wait till you guys just... Some of you saw the first screener, right? Yes, Everybody uh, see the first screener? Yeah. No? Oh, you got you got fucked. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk to talk to these guys. They'll send you a screener. The first one went out. It's the first episode. Oh, great. Right? You guys all got the first episode? Yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's awesome, man. Wait to see the teaser. It's just it's a really good season. And, you know, I always look at the real, reality is great. The fight's fucking. And that's all I really care about. That's the way I feel about Tough Mexico, too. Going into Tough 19, I knew. I was like, oh, my God. I don't know. I don't know how long people are going to hang in there for this, you know, but we got a good one this season. Everybody's going to be happy. Uh, Fox, Eric Shanks is. Craig, how many times does Shanks call and talk about this season of The Ultimate Fighter? Oh, three or four times. How much he loves it. Every time he watches a new episode, he's like, oh, my God. This season, the Ultimate Fighter. So they're really happy. Just because you brought up uh, Ultimate Fighter Mexico, having watched that first season, to me, for some reason in my mind, I thought it helped the familiarity, the fact that it was in Vegas, it was in the house. It, it was there thought on the production side of it that maybe that would help familiarize the viewer with, with the product? Well, we've tried to we've tried to move the thing around and do do some stuff, but it's it's a lot easier when we can do it in Vegas. And Vegas makes sense. It's the fight capital of the world. You know. <laughs> It, uh, I, I like it. It's a, it's a lot easier on me and, and my crew for sure. A few years ago, you uh, obviously famously said your opinion on women's MMA. Now, three years later, Ronda Rousey, arguably one of the biggest stars in the sport. Now we've got the 115 pound division. It sounds like you love the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. Is this, uh, is this still kind of the opening for another division at some point? You know, I know a lot of 125ers want to get here, and that seems like that could now, be. No, uh, I, I, you know, because we, we have two divisions, like that 125 is right in the middle. And, Screw a lot of things up. We're going we're to stay here for a long time. We're going to be at 115 and 135 for a long time. Did you hear anything about how uh, week two in, for Tough Mexico did in, in Mexico? Yeah, so it went head-to-head -head with the Video Music Awards, and we did 6.6 .6 million viewers. Really? Yeah, that's huge. So we were really happy. They were pumped. So that's good. Yeah, just a follow-up on Askren. I, I feel like I've been able to uh, decipher your tone when you're kind of warming up to something. That, that was a different response than usual. Was it? Yeah, it seems like you were warming up to There you it. go. I must be warming up then. <laughs> if Errol Hawani says I'm warming up, I must be. <laughs> Listen, I'll warm up to fucking anything right now, man. I'm in a good mood. <laughs> uh, what has changed? Because before... This... Tonight was a great night. Oh, so it's <laughs> yeah, just it all tonight? came together, yeah. Have you... Listen, Ben Askren said, said a lot of stupid shit, you know, when he, uh, when he left. But I don't care about stuff like that. I, I could care less about any of that. You know, um... We'll see how the kid, how the kid fights, what he keeps doing. We'll, we'll go from there. You know, I, I don't. Contrary to popular belief, the, the, well, no, I do hold grudges. If you're a real, if you're a real idiot, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll hold a grudge till the day I drop dead. But with fighters, I, I, don't, I don't really do that with fighters. You know, guys, these guys are, these guys are built different than everybody. They're, they're tough guys, man. This is what they do for a living, and they're gonna say stuff like that. If Tito could come back to the UFC, anybody can come in here. Believe me. 
because there's nobody on earth I hated worse than Tito. And Tito came back. You know, don't have to like him to do business with him. So we'll see. Now, Dana, maybe Rich Franklin can help make it happen. <laughs> Dana, given what you know, I know you can't tell us too much about the Ultimate Fighter season with the strong women, but given what you know, did you see a woman in there that could have the star power of Ronda Rousey? Wait, yes. Wait till you guys see the season of the Ultimate Fighter, man. It's so good. It's so good, and the fights are so good. Like he was saying about um, me not warming up to it earlier, the reason I didn't was because I saw that fight up in Northern California that time, and it was such a mismatch. It was horrible. And uh, women's MMA has come so far, you know, in 13 years. It's unbelievable. Um, and you guys are going to be blown away. Yeah, there, there's a Ronda Rousey on this season of The Ultimate Fighter. Absolutely. Do you guys have any plans of uh, breaking ground in the UFC complex? Like, I, I know you bought all, a bunch of land. You were going to start to... Soon, I think. I don't Is know when. You know when that is, Craig? Sorry. When are we breaking ground? On the UFC complex? Oh, when are we the new offices. Around? 18 to 24 months. He goes to all the meetings that I don't go to. <laughs> it's going to be a while. Uh, sounds like two years. It's massive, though. It's going to be huge. So They're, they've been working on it forever. Have you decided to pull Dave Schaller from any future wins? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Dave Schaller wow. will not ruin another step and repeat. Okay, <laughs> Ruined a perfectly good step and repeat banner. Got it. I've got it. Thanks, Damon. <laughs> yeah. We're getting low on questions here if you're asking <laughs> other questions, right? We seemed, done? It seemed like you had a good time in Macau and Hong Kong recently. Uh, are you happy there? Are you interested in actually bringing I love it, man. Around? I love it. I could live in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. I love that city. It's funny, you know, we, we, we moved into Asia to start, you know, uh, you know, building that market over there. But those of you that haven't been to a recent fight there, you guys should get over there. Hong Kong is a 30-minute boat ride from Macau. The Venetian Macau is the sickest, craziest building you will ever be in. You know, I was thinking, I grew up in Vegas. You know, it's another place with casinos. I've been to, you know, Indian reservations, and I've been to Atlantic City. I've been to all these places. <laughs> the Venetian Macau is like one of the eighth wonders of the world. This thing is 16 million square feet. There's so many people in this building, you can't believe it. They're putting on all these huge events. The city around there is really cool. Hong Kong is amazing. You know, I, I know you guys don't have massive budgets, you know, to travel around with, but you guys should make one of the fights in Macau, one of your, one of your stops. It's definitely um, a bucket list thing. It's, it's really cool. Um, and, and the thing that I like about it, it's, it's a great destination, not just for, you know, the people in China, but for people in the UK. There were a lot of people from Australia there. Um, you know, people have been traveling, um, and our relationship is getting even better and better with, with the Venetian Macau, and we're going to end up doing some real big things with these guys. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Dana, so, will that kind of halt you from going up to the mainland at some point? No, no, no. We're going to go into mainland China, too. But you have to, you know, we have to go in there and, and, and slowly build the market and not just build the market as far as the fans go, but the talent. Dana, you, you, there was rumors about Turkey. What's the next new Asian country? Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to Mexico first. Um, I, I, not Turkey, but there's, there was some other place that we were going. Uh, I, we're, go, we're going to the Philippines. We're going to Korea. I mean, we're focusing on Asia right now. Any chance you're going to go down south, South America, Peru, yep. Chile, any of them? Again, we, you know, think about this. Dave just asked me about the second episode of The Ultimate Fighter, right? Think about what we just did in Mexico. We just broke every record in the arena in, in Mexico City history. Broke every record with ticket sales there, right? We just went on TV with The Ultimate Fighter and did seven million, came back to back, went against the, the, the Video Music Awards, which I guess is a big deal down there. And uh, you know, we did 6.6 .6 million in a completely uneducated market about MMA. Mexico isn't, isn't uh, you know, when we went into Brazil, the first episode of The Ultimate Fighter did 12 million viewers, right? The whole country is, is very educated about MMA. I mean, it started down there. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Valley Tudo, you know, it's been down there. We went into Mexico and pulled these kind of numbers and did this kind of a sellout in a market that knows nothing about the UFC or MMA. So, what was my point? What did you ask me? If you're going to go down south to the... Yeah, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, so we're, we were on UFC Network down in all these other countries, and as we continue to build, you know, talent, market, the whole thing, yes. The answer is yes. That was my long-winded answer to yes. Um, but it's, it's fucking amazing, man. It's fun. I'm, I'm having a really good time with all that stuff. Did you uh, 
you know, do you kind of, I don't know if the word is regret, but would you kind of like look at perhaps doing Plaza Mexico or, a, you know, like a bull ring or something like that in Mexico City? In a bull ring? Something um, like that. You know, I, an, outdoor, an outdoor show. I went to a Junior Cause Jones. Because uh, Sean uh, has fought there, the outside one city. And Jun Jun down, in, down in Tijuana, Junior Jones fought. Remember Poison Junior Jones? Well, I've, I've been in IC Tijuana before. He, he, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we'd do it, but it was great to see a boxing match there. Um, the only, you know, the only outdoor arenas we would do are places that it doesn't rain very much. It doesn't get very windy. It's too scary, you know. Um, but why do we got to go to a bowl ring? There's stadiums well, everywhere. Because it's, it's cool. If you sold 20,000 tickets in, in, in eight hours, you maybe could have sold 40,000 tickets or 50,000 tickets if you, you yeah. know. You know what I, I get it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I, listen, selling, selling, going into a market the first time that's not very educated on MMA and selling 21,000 tickets, you know, that's pretty big. It'd be pretty ballsy to try to go to a 40,000 seat arena down there, you know. Um, we did it the right way and it worked out perfect. Dana, you pretty much got most of your shows plotted out for 2014. 2015, can we expect more shows, same amount, less? What do you expect? I think we're going to do the same amount that we're doing this year, next year. As far as I know right now, <laughs> see what happens. You guys are thinking now, man, the wheels are spinning. <laughs> what color shirt are you going to wear tomorrow? <laughs> Good night, you guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Except all the people that say negative shit. <laughs> see you later.